Peter Bucart, the brewmaster for New Belgium Brewing, joins me this week to discuss his new book, Wood and Beer. This is Beersmith Podcast number 127. This is Beersmith episode number 127, and it's early June 2016. Peter Bucart, the brewmaster from New Belgium Brewery, joins me this week to introduce his new book, Wood and Beer. Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. You get six amazing issues each year, packed with information for brewers and beer fans. This month's issue has a detailed focus on saisons, as well as brewer profiles and beercation ideas. I encourage you to check out this great magazine for home brewers at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also Anvil, a new line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. Anvil's new kettle strainer is just what you've been waiting for. Stainless steel construction and plug resistant. This filtration screen efficiently filters out all your hops and trube. It's easily clean and available now at a very attractive $44.99 price point. Find out more about Anvil at anvilbrewing.com. Again, that's anvilbrewing.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile, the mobile version of Beersmith, is the perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. It includes all the tools you need to create recipes on the go, share them with your friends, and acts as a pocket brew timer. Check out Beersmith Mobile at beersmith.com slash mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon App Store. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Peter Buchart, co-author of the new book, Wood and Beer, A Brewer's Guide from Brewers Publications. Peter is the brewmaster at New Belgium Brewing Company, which many of you know and holds a master's degree in brewing and fermentation technology from the University of Ghent in Belgium. Peter has won both World Cup and Great American Beer Festival Awards, along with many other brewing accolades. Peter, it is fantastic to have you on the show. Nice to be here. It's a, it's a great honor to have uh, someone as, as well known as you uh, uh, on the show. Yeah, it's always funny, the, the brewery or the, um, the quality of the brewery reflects on the brewmaster, eh? Absolutely, it does. Yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic. Um, before we dive into your new book, I wanted to uh, say a few words about your experience as a brewmaster at New Belgium, uh, which of course is widely recognized for you know brands like Fat Tire and, and many others. Um, uh, how's how's it been? How's your experience been? You've been there quite a while, right? Yeah. So it's my I just took my second sabbatical. We get a sabbatical after ten years, so uh, I'm twenty years here. Um, it's been incredible in in general. Um, first on the New Belgium level itself, I was surprised coming here. There was so much um, to be done and I thought it was maybe a stop in my career. Like, hey, I'm going to hang out a bit there and uh, where do I go next and afterwards. Um, when I came, came up for my ownership, I only wanted to say that I was going to stay here as long as I could learn. And it never really stops. And that's so far been the beauty for me. Uh, if it stops, I would leave. But uh, so far, it's been crazy. There's really a second point also that uh, took me by surprise, actually, is that um, I thought in 96 that the American craft brewing scene was already a bit saturated. And look on where we are now and how it keeps on going and i'm so happy to be part of this crazy american brewing scene here yeah it is, it's pretty amazing i remember we went through a little dip i think around 99 2000 right and then yeah. uh, and then things picked up again right yeah the, in the craft brewers conference in 96 uh, i think it was charlie Papagian or dave edgar who was talking about how it became tough for craft brewers and uh, that there were almost more failures than uh, startups. Um, and we haven't really seen that anymore again since. Uh, and now it's still a party and you would wonder where this party is going to end. Uh. But there's still... It's never going to end. Never going to end. <laughs> well, my sabbatical, um, I just went out west and met so many beautiful people, met so many beautiful breweries. Um, and... There's so much beauty still out there. Uh, it took me by surprise, actually. So after 20 years of being in it, you see still what people are doing, and it's incredible. And you guys are still putting out really innovative beers, too. A few here and there. A few here and there. Yeah, right. Um, well, what do you have in the in the store for, for uh, new things at New Belgium? 
I mean, the, the hardest one that we just cracked off is um, or still a bit working on. We did uh, five collaborations with uh, U.S. breweries. We let them goof off on um, on fat tire. So we have two with bread, one who was fermented with bread and a mice's one that's bottle conditioned. We have a sour, we have a malt variation, and we have a, a dry hop version. And they all come from different breweries um, throughout the U.S. that uh, we invited to, hey, would you like to make a beer that we're going to make uh, fit in a mix pack? And there's two fat tires in there, and then there's two of each of those beers in there. That's that's pretty awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a bit of a nightmare to pull it off because we had so many different yeast, so many different processes coming in all at once. Basically, before the summer ramp up, it was um, a little bit hard, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of your beers. You guys do some really innovative stuff, which I think is fantastic. Um, well, you teamed up for with uh, Dick Cantwell for your uh, Wood and Beer book, which just came out. Uh, what inspired you to write a book on wood and beer? Uh, I think the BA did a good job on approaching me with Dick um, as um, somebody who could write it. But for me, the key thing was um, I asked for quite some lead time. And the main thing was that I wanted to travel a bit around it. And the travel really has been beautiful. We went to Scotland. We went to France, where the bigger uh, fooders are made. We went to Kentucky and from there to Michigan to visit some breweries and some bourbon uh, distilleries and, of course, bourbon barrel making. And uh, that was the most enticing. Maybe if you ask Dick, he's going to have a slightly different answer because sometimes he was packed with... Did you, did you sample any bourbon along the way? Of course, but um, we're both not such a huge bourbon drinkers. But we, of course, had to taste the differences that are happening. We always uh, went to a brewery in the evening, you know. Yeah, that's that's awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, you decided to write this book. Did you do it while you were on your sabbatical? No, no, no. I took the sabbatical in between the end. Uh, so we had to close it in um, really the last read we had. And uh, the last captions that we could add was in... Uh, January, the third week of January. So I took uh, somewhere half March to half April off. And I was really in between. Um, I was happy that the book was finally done also because it's uh, an added workload. I didn't really have any idea what it would mean. Dick really knew way better, but he kind of kept it going. He, he really kept it going. He, pro he probably didn't tell you, though, how much work is yeah. involved in writing a book, right? He, he dosed it. Uh, he told it at appropriate times. And then Christy on, on the BA side, the Brewers Association side, is really great on trying to keep you on schedule. And, um, hey, no, this is the last edition. You, you will not. Uh, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's quite a challenge writing a book. Uh, it really is. A lot of people don't understand how much work's involved. Yeah, and I, you have your daytime job also on the side, <laughs> or maybe reverse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think you had it right. Uh, your daytime job's kind of on the side. It's uh, it's pretty challenging. Um, well, they were, uh, I, I've got a copy of your book right here, and uh, nice. you open the book with a chapter on the history of the barrel. Um, can you give us a short overview of uh, how barrels came to be associated with beer? Because that wasn't always so, right? I think that's a funny question. Um because I think barrels were associated with beer and wine was associated with amphoras. Um, and now it's kind of reversed. People think about uh, um, that <coughs> beer is reapproaching barrels, but we kind of lost it a little bit, um, our barrels, friends. Um, within the U.S., it was mainly due to oil finding in, uh, in Pennsylvania, actually, <laughs> that sucked the market of barrels dry uh, because they had to ship this murky thing somewhere so they needed containers they built a five mile um pipeline uh to ra um how do you say that a raffinadery or something that distills the oil um but oil suddenly swiped up all the barrels in uh, the u.s and for me that was very fascinating i found some very good um books on histories of barrels in the u.s um that I was completely unaware of. Mm -hmm. And that was a fantastic part about, for me, going into the book, fantastic learning opportunity. And you mentioned uh, amphoras. It goes all the way back to Roman times, right? History? Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, if you look at... Uh, you know, I want to talk about just what an amphora is, too. I'm not sure everybody's familiar yeah. with that term. So an amphora is a clay pot that has a pointed uh, bottom, and it, it comes up, and then it has neck with one or two ears so that they could carry it, and they could also roll it and stack it in ships, very stable, so in the bottom of the ship. Um, it was really when the Romans went over the the Alps, that they started to find barrels being used as a way lighter and easy to roll and easy to tip over device uh, compared to their, yeah, kind of um, um, amphoras that were not very handy to deal with. There was a lot of resistance to use them for wine, um, but it happened over the years, and that part is not very well documented how that became. Mm Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, when do we actually start using it? I mean, was it always used for beer or did we start using it uh, later for beer? I mean, if you look to where beer started, um, they've just found a 5,000-year-old bre- uh, brewery in China. Uh, the New York Times this week was reporting about that. Um, at that point, of course, it was mostly clay work that they were using because uh, uh, China and Sumeria or the... Uh, how they get the um, how do you say that uh, current um, Iran, um, uh, at that, there was not that much wood. So at that point, there was more the use of um, uh, ceramic devices for larger vessels. But the Celts for meat and for whatever they were using for alcoholic and other fermentation or other containers. And that's kind of the unique part. It was a container. It, right. it was used for salt, um, fish chickens, um, turpentine, name it. Um, it was the, the container over thousand and thousand years. And we kind of forgot about that. Maybe now think about wine using it, but that's a, a wine and bourbon, but uh, that is such a small leftover of what barrel making used to be. In 1903, there were 16, 000, uh, 16 million tight barrels made and I can be a bit off but I think it was still around 8 million slack barrels so for chickens and for salt or whatever so it was a huge industry and it has collapsed to around 2.5 million barrels a year now wow and uh, you mentioned the use of barrels has evolved quite a bit over time how so how you know, how are we uh, using I mean obviously you don't buy beer in barrels anymore right I mean, the the use of uh, has changed because barrels were the transportation mean, besides the storage and the fermentation mean. um, But uh, the transportation is completely out of the picture nowadays. That's maybe why we can have those weaker barrels that a bourbon is using. They are not really meant for transportation. They're only meant for a single use. So at that point, those barrels didn't need that higher quality anymore that we still see on the wine barrels who are intended for more and longer uses. Eh? Right. Do I answer your question? No, 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 you did. You did. Um, well, you also write about the art of cooperage or making barrels. Uh, how is a uh, barrel actually made? I know this used to be a big part of a brewery actually was making barrels, right? Yeah, and it's a big part of U.S. history. It's a big part of any uh, civilization almost. Uh, and Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit because... Uh, sometimes leather, leather bladders and um, ceramic devices were used for storage and, and sometimes transportation. But really, barrels have been with us forever. Um, so it was an art that, uh, if you look to the first ships that came to the U.S., they always had to, it's documented that they ha- were had to have a cooper on site to mm-hmm. fix the ship, but also to dismantle the barrels that weren't in use anymore so that they had a bit more pay- place for sleeping or living. Um, or sometimes while they were fishing and they were maybe collecting some things again uh, uh, during the transportation and needed barrels again. The use of burning out barrels is also kind of, for me, it, this may be a little bit made up, but... Um, you kind of see it through history. Barrels were used for everything, so you didn't really know what was in there before. So burning them on the inside was good use of getting rid of the flavor and the aroma or maybe the explosivity or whatever it was of uh, the previous uh, stuff that was contained in the barrel. Uh, mm-hmm. So in now 
it is still used in bourbon, but I think it originated or it was used throughout history as a, a mean to get in between from beer to fish or something. So, I mean, how were these barrels actually made? You talk about burning the inside of them and things like that. Um, they were, that wasn't always the case either, right? No, 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 that's not always the case. Um, initially, they weren't really toasted. Um, toasting really came in, the, came in because they applying some heat made the barrel more bendable. And so um, you had to apply some heat. It wasn't really done for flavor, where it's really is the main focus now. They still heat it uh, before bending moisturizing it a little bit on the inside um, but maybe I should step back uh, barrels come from staves staves are dried for a couple of years um, so that a, um, there's a slight degradation it's actually a mold who um, goes through the wood and it releases some of the sugars and other nutrients that are present it also takes some away some of the uh, how do you say that uh, a harsh and so on that's harsh gonna, flavor, yeah. Uh, that's going to prevent uh, the barrel from being uh, in contact with um, with microorganisms, um, or or would harm the microorganisms eventually. So after that aging, then the staves are shaped; they are concave on the inside, uh, or is it reverse? And they're also uh, shaped on the outside, and then they're going to make a barrel, basically. Um, raise the barrel is how they say that this is still manual wherever you go even in a cooperage that makes 2,000 barrels a day like in uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky the, wood for, for, uh, the Brown Foreman cooperage um, and then uh, applying of heat trying to bend it so that they can put uh, another temporary hoop up on uh, the upper side so at that point we have the shape of a barrel but with temporary hoops uh, then they will take off those temporary hoops, fit it with um, the heads on both sides. They're going to uh, put temporary hoops back. And then they're going to shave on the outside completely, especially for the wine barrels, to make them look nice. Um, they're going to shave them again. And then they put the real uh, barrel rings up. They pressure test them. If there's something wrong, well, at that point, you can see still that they... Um, or doing really old cooperage work where they're going to try to fix the little leaks. Um, but typically those are pretty highly automated So um, nowadays, except for the raising, the burning even in the case of Kentucky is uh, typically automated. On the wine side, the toasting is often not. Um, but <laughs> some, some smaller cooperages, there's still some, a lot of, uh, sorry, a lot of... Um, manual labor involved because they make different sizes they reshape barrels to make them from bur uh, bourbon into whiskey um, it's really a fascinating but kind of an ancient technology nothing has really changed much in making a barrel that's yeah, really cool I, I went to Williamsburg in Virginia um, to kind of see what they do there um, so they make all the cooperage work for uh, the museum there, and it's fantastic to see, but really you can see all the steps as they are done in a manual fashion. And it's really very nice to see that uh, you kind of get a good scope on what it is on how to make a barrel. Yeah, it was interesting. I went to uh, Dublin and went to the Guinness Museum there, of course, and, and they had pictures of, of uh, from the old days where they had literally hundreds of people making barrels. Just just that was their full time job making the barrels. Yeah, there uh, was to store a, the beer. There was a large amount of labor. If you see that, it's even um, mm -hmm. all the docks in um, the harbors uh, had a huge population on. Um, on cooperage, uh, but mostly slack barrel makers, so the barrels that weren't watertight for apples, uh, again. Um, and that, those were kind of the lowest tiers of the, the cooperage makers. The, the, the guys who really made the beer barrels that had to be under pressure, that was kind of the highest. And then above that, you had the food release, uh, the, the guys who make the large upstanding barrels, who's a one by one, and every foodery that we visited, they still make one a day. Uh, sorry, yeah, one a day roughly. And so they have uh, multiple cooperages, but they're all custom made, you know. Awesome. Well, let's get into uh, actually making beer. Uh, the flavors we get from the wood are uh, closely related to the type of wood they're made of. Um, what are some of the popular woods that are used for the barrels, uh, and and how do the you know why are these woods favored over other woods, for example? 
because of an act of Congress. Uh, is that is that right? There's an act of Congress there. I mean, um, the um, cooperage unions uh, really lost so much work um, r shortly before World War II, and they lobbied actually to get um, uh, bourbon to use f single use uh, American oak barrels. So, since this is the largest input on um, barrels, this act of Congress uh, is really American oak is the biggest. No Would kidding. So, I, so a lot of it's driven just by the law, huh? Yeah. I, it didn't used to be. It's not bad. Uh, that's what I said. But uh, for the unions, it has really been a good one to lobby uh, Congress to do so. Um, and if you now look at the bourbon makers, they really make a nice product out of it. Eh? But this is huge. This is uh, the, around 2 million. And currently, there's a, a bourbon is doing very well right now. And so there's actually a shortage on barrel making. Um, a smaller distillers start to have troubles and they are making whiskey because they cannot get to the new barrels who are by law required to use for making bourbon. And you mentioned single use too. Is that a part of the law as well? You can only use it yeah. once? Yeah, and then <laughs> after that, it's not bourbon anymore. So, so, where, so what is it? That, where, is it go, where do they go then? Do they sell them off? Uh, oh, you can use them for... Whiskey, vodka, brewers buy a lot right now. The biggest part of the bourbon barrel still goes nowadays to Scotland and Ireland for um, uh, Scots whiskey. whiskey yeah? um, so, so after we use them once here, we ship them over to Ireland? Yeah, and it's funny. There's such a market in that. There's a few companies who ship them whole, and they are sometimes reshaped in Scotland or in the U.S. Sometimes they put them all in, st in staves, and then there's a huge... Uh, Cooperage in Scotland that receives containers load of shapes and uh, of, of staves and basically reshapes barrels out of it. it it's amazing. That's it, cool. It, and that was something we wanted to retrace in the book also with our travel. So uh, we went to Bourbon, we went to Scotland and basically saw it on both sides of the, the pond on where the majority of the flow of the barrels go. A thing apart then is... Um, uh, the wine barrel making eh? and there there's a lot of American oak but typically that's uh, most is still French oak but that's only a fourth of the business of um, barrel making right now in the world and then there's some outlayers uh, there's some uh, port barrels made in Portugal and in Spain um, Spain also uses some uh, American wood wine barrels made it's mm -hmm. kind of a funny one but it's it's also due to history barrels that came back with stuff from the U.S. that was used then to make wine. And uh, yeah, if you go then to countries like Brazil, like Cachaça or something, um, has its own history on barrels. Australia is more using uh, Romanian, French, uh, um, a little bit of American barrels. So yeah, it, it's an interesting trade to retrace um, all uh, where those barrels come from and go to. So I assume they're not using oak, all of them, though, right? What, what are some other right. woods that are commonly used outside the U.S.? So there's a large section on the book uh, um, on different uh, woods, but most of it is oak. And in the U.S., it's mostly American wood, who is actually way more watertight than French. Um, but you see quite a bit of French oak being used here, and then especially coming from the winemakers. Uh, um, for me, the most unique part that I found was uh, the Brazil um, uh, cachaça. They have a lot of endemic woods that they're using who are really beautiful. And I had some uh, um, Brazilian brewers coming over with the Great American Beer Festival last year. And they brought me three different uh, small barrels um, with two, from three different woods where we have been playing with. And there's really so much beauty still that... Maybe it's undiscovered, at least in this part of the world. That's awesome. Um, well, since most beer is made from used or secondhand barrels, uh, can you cover selecting and inspecting barrels, particularly for homebrewers? What, what would a homebrewer look for uh, when trying to find a barrel that they could use? For me, it comes very intuitive. Uh, um, it's aroma. It's the sound. It's how they feel and how they look. It, aroma will tell you a lot. If you smell it, you have to take care. Sometimes the French, um, the wine barrels can be softened. Um, 
so first uh, take a whiff of the aroma if it's too much sulfur um, stay out of it but that's a good sign that um, the, um, the previous user at least has a uh, used um, sulfur to to keep them uh, microbiological clean bourbon barrels should smell to bourbon, rum barrels to rum, wine can smell really, really beautiful. If you have off aromas, uh, moldy or um, dry or old wood, that's kind of a sign on the wall in my eyes that there's something that is um, wrong. Look and feel, or sorry, um, sound and feel, that's more, you roll the barrel around while you look at it, it just does a feel watertight. Mm -hmm. Is it really a sturdy barrel? You're going to see that right away. If you start to feel uh, or see gaps, the moment you feel something wrong, you're like, okay, I need to look very close. But look at the wood completely. Um, there's long descriptions in the book, basically on how um, staves are made. I think it's important um, if you inspect a barrel that you have that background on how does a stave come from a barrel what part of a tree is used and what should I focus on and there's lighter colored um, rays metallurgy rays on the, uh, on the wood that you can see and if it's a French oak barrel and those are not across the stave you can have a problem but it's, it's easy to see if it's American oak, they just can saw that because it's a way better watertight wood. So don't worry too much about American wood. Um, it should be watertight. You can try it with filling. Um, but it's typically not going to leak as much through wood as um, French um, barrels will do. Um, then, of course, the look, you should go inside. Um, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, the... Look, inside is kind of a tough one, but I would really recommend that you at least do an inspection through the bunghole um, uh, with a light, maybe with a dentist mirror. But the worst place of a barrel is really underneath the bunghole because that's the uh, piece that has been exposed to the highest pressure. And it's also the piece that's going to be um, exposed to um, sediment that sits there where right. pH can drop quite a bit. or So it's the worst part, and that's the part you see. While you're looking through the bung, the bung stave itself is also a weak stave because they drill the hole right through it. And so look on the sides of the bung for cracks. Quite often, you will see them. Hammer ones on it, you will feel if it's still sturdy. Often it's going to be watertight, you will be surprised. And you see a huge crack in it. Try it again on a... Um, on uh, anyway, with filling it to me then there's one step further that we're trying to describe but um, for that I, mo you almost have to have a spare barrel if you, at least if you do it the first time and some tools, most of the tools you can make yourself um, just give an indication, uh, the tools will sorry, what you want to do with the tools is you take out the head and you're going to put it back and so we're trying to describe that, but that's not going to make you a Cooper. Um, I just did one. Uh, there was an MBA meeting here last week, weekend or last Friday in for Collins. Um, and I did one uh, for 200 people. I showed uh, basically I started hammering on a podium. But just my purpose is more to show, don't be afraid. It's very simple. And like anything in life, it will take some practice. Um, but you can do it. You can make it watertight. We talk about how you make a wheat paste and put it back in the um, round uh, where you're going to put the head. Or there's some other tricks like wax or blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's really fun in my eyes. And so if you have an old barrel or if you have a, a local brewery that uh, uh, wants you to hand you over a barrel, Maybe play with it and just learn. And for me, it, it's really a fun one to do, but it's a bit scary, you know, like anything new. Well, you always make a mistake, but that's okay. That's how you learn, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, what are some of the environmental considerations that come into play when you're uh, storing, aging, working with barrels? Obviously, the wood's kind of a living thing, really. Um, what, what, what are some of the things to worry about? Well, first one would be humidity of the cellar eh? um, or wherever you store it. We have problems here in Colorado. We have a very dry environment. So we devised um, fans with basically um, misters. We, we put a, 
hoses with misters around it and we blow the fans. We wet the floor just to bring up the whole humidity of the cellar. Um, if you so live you in, must do this on a regular basis then, right? Daily. Daily. <laughs> Yeah, in, in, in when I was working at Rodema, we didn't have to do that because Belgium is moist enough. A lot of parts of the U.S. are uh, moist enough, but we do have a lot of dry parts. I visited a brewery in uh, Arizona, and they had made a whole cellar with basically humidifiers. Um, it was really funny to see, but they did the right thing, you know. There, there's a little bit of risk if you go if you have too high humidity, you can have mold development. And you will see mold development. I heard that from a brewer in Dallas. They had overnight, a humid night, and they came back and it was completely black mold. So they had oh a boy. lot of yeah, a lot of work to remove that black mold again. So there is an ideal there in the 65, 75% moisture. It's really hard to achieve for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, 65% is pretty high, really, I would think. Yeah, for Colorado, that is damned high. <laughs> you, you want to get there, it's it's gets 20% here during the daytime. Um, but that's the first one. And temperature would be second, but it's more related to beer quality also. And you can go cold or hot. Uh, founders in um, rapid... Uh, what is that... Uh, in Michigan, my founders uh, want to say Rapid City. Uh, they are storing in a mine, in a gypsum mine, and they actually cool the mine further because they want to just have a, an aging that is a wood extraction for their breakfast stout. Um, so, I mean, is there uh, an ideal temperature range that's good for uh, for extracting wood flavors out of the barrel? I mean, it also will suppress any microbiological development. Eh? And so that's good if you if that's not your so, aim. So you're saying cooler's better then? For in the case you don't want uh, microbiological development, if you just want to have an extraction of the previous flavor that was in there or from the wood itself, colder is better. If you want to go to souring, you probably want to be up there a bit more in the 15 to 20 C. And there's quite some opinions there. You don't want to go too hot. Uh, acetic acid development would be your problem. Uh, at that point, but if you want to have a lactic souring, a natural lactic souring, you want to stay in that range that is more Belgian weather like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, on temperature, uh, and we also describe that in the book, I think, but I was thinking on environmental, think also about what's happening around your wood. Uh, um, I see a lot of. Um, barrels nowadays in, in breweries in their tasting room hey, what are the aromas and tastes in your um, in your room, it's wood you know it will take up flavors from around, uh, from its surrounding whatever uh, that is around you happening can taint your wood over time so take care about that an interesting process that they do in bourbon is fluctuating temperatures also. I forgot to mention that on the mm -hmm. temperatures. But it basically creates or pushes the liquid in and out the wood. And that's going to create a beautiful extraction project uh, process. Huh? We'll force it a bit. But um, that's how you can make 20 years old whiskeys in 10 years. Huh? So interesting. So they actually vary the temperature on purpose to do that? Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Um, well, uh, let's see, pushing the buttons here. Um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's dive into details a little bit here. What are some of the typical flavors you might hope to extract from wood? Huh. Um, typical flavors, they're all the, over the place. Uh, for me, it, it's really the key thing that is happening is the toasting. In barrels, if you have barrels, it's going to be very tannic. Um, and some woods, um, like cedar or something, or um, oh, what's the um, Anchorage Brewing using? They, they use a, a pine tree. They made a footer from a pine. And those are really hard products in the first years or the first usages that you have because you get a lot of the raw wood character if you don't toast it. So... Then toasting, what toasting does, typically toasting in most cases is done after aging the wood. So you have a partial degradation of the wood due to microorganisms and also leaching out. So they 
during the drying, they actually spray water over it so that they have a tannin leaching. You can see that if you go through cooperages that are aging their own wood, you see that um, those tannins brown puddles underneath those piles. So that's all pretty good because it prepares that wood and brings it to some smaller molecules that can be affected during the toasting. And that toasting process, it has the same like in beer or in malt uh, beer, like in the kettle here behind me, you have some Maillard reaction happening in between the amino acids and um, the sugars that are leading to color, uh, discoloration of, hey, you can increase your color of the beer by boiling. Um, uh, or you can increase the color of malt by by heating the malt again right, in a right. similar process. Same is true for barrels. So there then it comes down to at what moisture level, it's really the same like malt, at what moisture level do you drive up the temperature and that will create um, the different toast. The depth of the toast is influenced by the length of the toast. And so now if you apply that on the bourbon side, Hey, kind of new in bourbon is um, but new. They play also uh, some um, tequila barrels or basically just burnt, no toasting. Mm -hmm. So what happens there? Then you just have charcoaling. It's almost me going to be more filtered than uh, anything else from that is wood or the remaining of this wood will deliver. If they toast a little bit or if they have an initial heating process before the um, toasting, then you go again similar to what happens with uh, regular toasted barrels. What do you have there from flavor components? Uh, um, there's only that many that are soluble. Uh, the, really, the, the shell, the lignin, my accent eh, is going to be in a way, uh, doesn't really get affected in the whole process that much. There's a little bit of um, that happens in the toasting. It will also not do much during the aging of the beer. It's some of the other components that um, are going to be from the toasting, but also aroma components that are partly present or uh, created um, in the heating process that will leach. So, so, uh, so those, those, are the, those are the primary ones we get from the wood then, right? Yeah, and so there's some uh, very flavorful ones in there. Um, in, in, in whiskey, they're very after the, the lactone, lactones, they call them, um, that are present, especially in... Well, they're both uh, present in French and in American wood, but they get more expressed uh, through the extraction from American wood. And they're really key for um, bourbon. As such, and in, in, a, in a lesser stage also for um, uh, whiskey as such. So, um, it, again, I go, we go pretty deep in that in the, in the, beer, in the book itself. Um, and to me, beer is, is in a way a way more interesting liquid than... Uh, Others, maybe except for distilled. Distilled has a whole different extraction because the alcohol is so high. So it's really more an alcoholic extraction. So if we go with beer in, we get a whole different of extraction from what's left over. But what I think is unique on beer is the lower alcohol and then enzymatic uh, uh, reactions that are still happening with the wood. And we had quite some discussions with some of the wine uh, barrel scientists who didn't believe what we were saying, and maybe I'm, we could be off also, but the microbiology in that lower alcohol that we have in beer, plus the enzymatic reactions that we still have, uh, paired together, really, are making beer a very nice product for a secondary use, utilization of a barrel, but even for a primary utilization. And so, yes, there are flavors from the wood, but in beer, because of the microorganisms, some of those primary uh, flavors from the wood or primary components from the wood still get modified and become a beautiful piece of uh, the taste that you get from a barrel with beer. And then, of course, the other flavor component we get is from whatever the barrel was used for before, right? So, yeah, I mean, of course, a, lot of these, a, lot of these, a lot of these are used barrels, right? Yeah, you hear a lot of brewers talking that they use the barrel until neutral and then they go sour eh, with it. Yeah, our bur yeah, bourbon barrels, wine barrels, they all have their own character, right? 
Yeah, but if you age a few times beer in it, uh, the bourbon character and um, uh, really disappears. And that's why winemakers discard barrels. They age first relatively short. The second time, they're going to lengthen the process. The third time, they're going to lengthen it again, and then they sell it to us. Eh? So um, how does the extraction process actually work? I mean, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I was wondering if you could describe that process. It, it, it's interesting, uh, not to go into details, but it really takes a long time for the liquid to penetrate the wood. And so it's a very gradual process. Uh, you wouldn't think about it as such. Um, it's also, as the wood then gets degraded from the inside, um, it, the next layer becomes more available to be at, uh, attacked by the beer, attacked in a positive sense to release uh, flavors. Um, and it goes further and further. Like in, in Rodenbach, I had five to six and a half centimeter thick wooden barrels that were pretty much leached out. There was not much that I could do with them anymore. Uh, wood borers came in because uh, wood borers typically are not going to go into the center part of the wood. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's so tannin rich and it's really not very nice for them. But once the degradation has happened, in the case of Rodenbach, over 150 years, um, those barrels are really prone to attack and also to leakage at that point. Huh? Hmm. Um, for, for those of us that can't afford our own set of barrels, uh, what do you think about using wood chips and some of the other methods that people, uh, homebrewers use? So uh, wood interesting for wood flavor but what you miss is a um, big part of uh, wood chips is also related sorry about barrels is also related to the oxygen infusion that you get f towards the liquid eh? and that's true for bourbon or for wine or from uh, for beer uh, and that will really change your beer quite a bit um rush up to in um, palo alto he was suggesting to use um um, he called it basically a table steak. So if you put something in a hole, if you have a hole uh, in your um, growler or whatever you or use. Fermenter you know, or something, yeah. Yeah, even, even a plastic can be good because it will have some oxygen diffusion. Typically, the smaller the container it is, you're going to have way too, uh, way too much diffusion coming in. But um, you can play with it. I think if you have a glass container with a wooden table stick in it, it, it and then you can still have oat, oak inserts, but that little bit infusion that you get for the amount of liquid that you have, I think is a pretty good um, uh, compromise to create a little bit of oxygen infusion. So, I mean, is it, uh, do you recommend also infusing your chips with uh, bourbon or some other well, thing? If you want, why not? <laughs> you can go wherever. You can use the bourbon as such also. Um, you really can do well, it. Well, yeah, the leftover bourbon after you drink the rest, right? Yeah, but uh, uh, that uh, the sky is the limit on uh, what you want to do with um, the wood before. And we had some interesting hot sauce barrel beers um, on our trips that were really very beautiful because they had aged enough. It, it was, it really had become married. And I think that marriage is something you want to achieve. Initially, barrels have the tendency, or wood in general, have the tendency to create their flavor, but they can be very raw in the beginning. And if you let it sit for a longer time, uh, that marriage is really something you should try to achieve for most people. Yeah, products. you mentioned the tannin extraction is pretty high when you have fresh wood, I guess, yeah. 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 Um, well, uh, another popular use of barrels and wood is in sour beers. Um, what considerations come into play when you start using uh, barrels to age sour beers? I mean, um, to me, oxygen diffusion is really the main one. Why would you otherwise go on, uh, on wood? Hey, you can make sours in stainless. Lactobacilli live in stainless barrels. Uh, we see that now with a lot of kettle sours, but if you want to make leaf months, for instance, in Belgium, in the, what was uh, Michael Jackson calling that, the sour browns, I think, um, that is just uh, stainless aged beer. And so you can have the lactic development. Lactic acid is kind of a relatively, um, in a way, I call it a boring acid, because if you get some esterification, Due to some uh, microorganism, it becomes a little bit more interesting, but still not uh, great. In the case of Liebmanns, they add in fruit, and the fruit brings in the malic component, brings some other acidity in it, and at that point, you can really make uh, very beautiful sour beers. 
if you go into wood, you should go in it in my eyes for oxygen diffusion because the oxygen diffusion will activate a bunch of other organisms that can make a whole bunch of different acids. The main line, one we talk about uh, typically is acetic acid, who is on itself not that interesting, but. For me, it's more about it is different organisms that are going to be present at that time and are going to again esterify, make something of this acid with other components that are present in the beer and really make, like in La Folie, a lot of fruity flavors that are not coming from fruit at all. Huh? You, kept, you keep mentioning uh, uh, oxygen, introducing oxygen through the barrel. Um, you know, a lot of us have been taught that oxygen is actually pretty bad for your beers as far as the long-term stability and so on. But um, uh, wh wh what's the positive here by, by potentially adding oxygen? I think it is the positive. Hey, Charlie Bamford did once a talk and he's like, uh, we as brewers were kind of sissies because we don't want to oxidize our beer and then we have problems during shipping. Maybe we should do the reverse. Eh? We just let it oxidize and so it's stable and ship it then. And that's kind of a, uh, a bit of crazy proposition for uh, a lot of beers. But from a sour stance, that's really what's behind it. Eh? Those beers are really oxidized away. And so there's nothing to be oxidized anymore. So if you're going to keep them for another 10 years, they're going to be great, you know? Well, oxygen does different things to different beers, though, right? When you get a lighter colored beer, don't you get more of a like cardboard kind of, you know? Uh, well, the cardboard is more documented from uh, the lager stands, and because that's the biggest problem for lager brewers. But yeah, it's going to form aldehyde, it's going to form um, other flavor components. But really, a, a beer, beer making and lambic making especially is a redox exercise it's a balance between a reduction and oxidation that you're trying to form and so if you as you're slipping over time towards the oxidation side you really become in a stable stable environment again eh? it's something because we happen to Hey, the world for a billion years ago uh, was a reducing environment. Nowadays, it's uh, because of the organisms that were growing in the sea. Um, it's an oxidizing environment, so everything will oxidize. You can see it to my hair and to uh, my skin. Um, so everything will oxidize, but what's after that? Nothing. So hey, for me, it, I'm overstating that a little bit here. Eh? But if you have a sour beer that has been aged for a couple of years in wood, those beers are not going to move that much anymore compared to a lager that has been produced in an oxygen-free environment. Yeah, and I guess the other interesting, you know, you take a sour beer or you take even a, a nice dark beer, you get more of a, a, I don't know, you get this sort of wine, a you know, fine age flavor out of it when you oxidize mm -hmm. it, as opposed to the lighter beers where you get, get sort of more of an off flavor, I guess. Yeah, and I, it's all relative. Right? What do you call an off flavor and what do you call um, a flavor? Um, it, it's a whole different world out there if you go really on wood aged sour. So. Yeah. Um, well, I uh, wanted to cover a few more topics real quick. What about blending uh, either different beers or for homebrewers, we can, uh, we can even add trace amounts of bourbon or liqueurs or other ingredients uh, to, get, to get a desired flavor. What are your thoughts on that? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you don't have to barrel age your, your beer in this. So you just put bourbon right into it, right? Yeah, or I, you can, uh, I think about chefs. I, what is their limit? Um, hey, we are brewers, we are chefs. Uh, we don't have any limits. Oh yeah, maybe as commercial brewers, we have the TTBI behind us. Um, but um, the beauty comes from the combination of flavors. Hey, yeah, a single hop variety beer can be very good for uh, a learning perspective on what this hop is about, or what this aroma additive is about. But have you seen uh, um, chefs working with single spices? Oh, I made Not very uh, often, no. filet mignon only with um, coconut or whatever. No. Yeah. Hey, Pepper steak gonna... is the only thing I can think of, maybe. Yeah, but you're going to make a piece of beauty and how you create beauty is you can, I did a talk once in the AHA uh, keynote about uh, blue houses because hey, um, 
if you paint your house blue, it's not because the blueness of the house that is the PC of the beauty. It's how it's an integral part of your house. You're going to have thought about the windows, about the yard, about different things. And anything, we are just creating 10 minutes of pleasure. We're all in the same industry, you know. Um, go crazy. Uh, the home brewers are going to keep on pushing us commercial brewers with the crazy stuff they make, but we'll take uh, them a little bit away and we will, we'll have some crazy stuff coming out from time to time, you know, that we um, are going to um, f- give as a feedback to home brewers and it's, it's such a beautiful world out here to be a brewer. So that's why I said, of course. Fantastic, Peter. Um, well, I wanted to, we, we could try to cover uh, the book as best I could, but uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Maybe some topics we missed? Um, I think you completely missed uh, a key topic. You, we were talking about barrels. Sure. And there's so much uh, more. It's a book about wood and beer. Um, so what else do you have on wood? You have leaves, you have twigs that were used for um, making lauter beds in, in Norway, but also everywhere. Um, the, the sati, where you use the branches uh, from um, spruce. Um, the bark, bark can be toasted. Uh, sometimes it's flammable, lower flammable. We talked with some people, and I think it's in the book also, where they had some barks that were flaming up in their pizza oven instead of uh, just toasting. Um, uh, wood chips that you get off sap. Of uh, Why do you... Uh, we, we think about maple when we think about sap, but uh, sap itself, or maybe talked with some people that were reverse osmosing sap up, uh, concentrating sap up, so creating the sweetness and the mineral part of the sap and making something with that. Maybe, Wood, yeah, the tree is the limit. I haven't talked about roots yet, but uh, um, it's only, again, one part of what we... Barrel is one product that we can make with wood, but there's so much else to um, a tree, like there is so much else on anything else we could use in, uh, in life. So all kinds of wood flavors we can explore then, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, well, Peter, thank you. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on uh, uh, brewing with wood? Uh, my beer is empty. No, I'm done. Oh, you're you're done. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, well, Peter, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for being here. It's a uh, it's a great pleasure having you. Well, have fun uh, with uh, getting the podcast out. This was a fun interview. It was really my first one that I did around the wood book. So, well, I'm, I'm uh, hoping hoping we can do some more with you. Maybe you can come on sometime and talk about uh, uh, other aspects of brewing. Uh, I'm not planning on writing a book uh, anytime soon. No more books. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> currently I'm done. <laughs> this may be your last one. Huh? We'll see. <laughs> never say never. Well, thank you again, Peter. Uh, today, my guest was uh, Peter Buchart. He is brewmaster at New Belgium Brewing and co-author of the new book uh, called Wood and Beer. He holds a master's in fermentation technology and has won many international and national awards for his beers. Uh, Peter, thank you again for, uh, for coming on the show. It's great having you. Yeah, have fun. Thank you to Peter Buchart, brewmaster for New Belgium Brewing, for joining me this week. Thanks also to Anvil, the new line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. Anvil's new kettle strainer is a stainless steel filtration screen that's plug resistant and will efficiently filter out your hops and trube. It fits easily over your Anvil kettle dip tubes and is attractively priced at $44.99. Find out more about Anvil at anvilbrewing.com. Again, that's anvilbrewing.com. And also Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. You get six amazing issues each year, packed with information for brewers and beer fans. This month's issue has a detailed focus on saisons, as well as brewer profiles and beer cation ideas. I encourage you to check out this great magazine for home brewers at beerandbrewing.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile, the perfect brewing app for your iPhone, iPad, Android, or Kindle Fire device. Learn more about creating great beer recipes with Beersmith Mobile at beersmith.com mobile or on Google Play, iTunes, or the Kindle App Store. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.